And I'm just going to switch my phone off and okay. get all the distractions out of the way, right? Okay. Ah, so this meeting's being recorded and stuff. Yeah, I got it. Cool. So do you check my channel for uh, for a uh, music interview? I, I, it was too late here when I discovered it. Um, so since we uh, wrote and spoke, I, I had to sleep. Oh. Um, and there was a kind of a business call after we had uh, written, which was very late. But the guy I, I was doing that call with, we, we always talk at like 1, 1 a.m. to 2, 3 a.m. Because the time zone differences. So I'll, I'll definitely be doing some research. Um, okay. But I also thought it would be good to be completely surprised so that you catch me perhaps more honest and less prepared. So, uh, so I thought that was a good, a good angle. Thank you so much. Of course you checked my Wikipedia and you tell me you read my Wikipedia page, yes. Yeah, yeah, and I was listening to a good bit of your music on uh, what do you call it, uh, Bandcamp. So I was clicking a few different albums, some I older stuff, newer stuff. a lot of albums on Bandcamp, SoundCloud. I, I noticed. You're productive. Thank you so much. And it was good. The quality was perfectly fine. Um, the song structures were cool. They're what people would expect from the styles of electronic music. The sounds were nice. They were subtle. I like that. Um, the ambiences were nice. That's important for me when it comes to music, that there's, uh, there's like almost ambient, a sense of place. I like ambient music so much. But I'm um, thinking in the future to jump to experimental and noise. Your style and noise music is perfect. I checked your tracks in uh, SoundCloud, your masterpiece. Um, uh, thanks. Like it's, uh, it, it, you don't get so much feedback. It's not like, like noise like this or, uh, or experimental electronic music or just non beat oriented electronic music. It's not exactly like a, a massive genre that people either uh, take part in, listen to. It's not like party music and stuff. Um, but when people enjoy it, uh, they, they seem like, yeah, some people really get it. And funny enough, I'm actually wearing a T-shirt of a cool festival called uh, nice. Borderline. Very nice. That's, I like uh, it. So what's oh, happened yeah, to your I mean, camera? What's happened to your camera, that color? I don't know. It's a good laptop. And it did this from the start with the color, and I've never been able to fix it. And I've tried many times. Okay, okay, it's okay. Well, it's <laughs> but good I like to see look. you. It's... it's good to see you today. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, also, well, for, uh, for anyone you... in the future, okay. it's uh, what? It's Tuesday. It's uh, the 21st of June. So that's solstice, the summer solstice. And uh, it's 2022. So it's what? 12.30 here in Berlin, 12.40. What's your time there in Baghdad? Well, now let's check my phone. Well, now it's <laughs> the one at 39 p.m. Yeah. It's after yeah. Exactly. How hot is it there? What? How hot? Is it a very hot day today or well, a cold maybe, day? Maybe the weather 50 or 55 degrees. Celsius. It's hell. Whoa. <laughs> Do you know what that is in Fahrenheit, how the Americans would express that or any other countries where they use Fahrenheit? Well, maybe in America as a 30, I don't know. If it's Fahrenheit, like if, if you mean Celsius, like 50, 55 Celsius, I think in Fahrenheit, that's like 115 or 120, which is really extreme, like uh, extreme heat. The rock is so hot, so hot weather. Mm -hmm. So today I'm going to ask you just nine questions. We will speak about your creativity in art, about yeah, please. music and uh, other fields in art. Okay, so music interview with my friend Robin from Berlin. So question number one. So how you start making electronic music? Can you tell me your journey in art? How you start? Ooh. Oh, that's a cool question, actually. Uh, I started playing music when I think I was 14 years of age. And I begun on bass. And the reason why was my best friend at the time was a couple of years older. He was the person who got me into heavy metal music and, and punk. Well, more heavy metal trash with like Slayer in particular with their crazy. Slayer. Oh, yeah. With Rain and Blood. And he also gave me a copy of the Black Album, wow. which I thought was cool. But when I heard Rain and Blood and the first song, Angel of Death, I was blown away. 
Um, and that really changed my life. Literally hearing that album changed my life. And I would think I was 12. So a couple of years later, he had gotten a guitar and an amp. He had a summer job or something. And I begged my parents. Um, and my brother did too, because he was kind of in on, we were, we were kind of like a, a trinity, as if it were. The three of us were, were often together, piling around together. We, often, we did sport together as well, rowing. I managed to convince our parents to get us a bass guitar for me and my brother drums. He was drumming on pots and pans and stuff in our French shed. And he clearly had rhythm. Um, so we told our parents, like, no more pocket money, no more Christmas money, no more birthday money. And I actually showed them that it was cheaper to buy the instruments than we lose all that, all those privileges. So they actually did it. Thankfully, our uncle also helped a lot with buying the instruments. But then at that time, my brother was DJing and he was actually DJing in youth clubs and stuff and for big teenage parties. But he actually stumbled across some really good techno records in a re record store that were on special order for a big DJ it's in right our hometown. It's right there. Yeah. Um, um, I guess so, but it was perhaps, but it was the harder records that interested us because this was 1992, 1993. And there were some harder records and there was a particular label called Hard House. And Joey Beltram in particular is a guy from New York who's still performing now. And he was DJing then. And my brother loved his sound. And funny enough, the Prodigy were huge and they had a cool sound. But what was being played in the clubs, the adult clubs, was much more interesting um, regarding the pop and so on at the time, like Two Unlimited and all this Euro pop. Um, and... Yeah, we started to kind of hear like certain bands like Ministry, Nine Inch Nails, we were fans of, and Ministry, Fear Factory. And we would hear all these clips of films and stuff. And we learned that's been played with a sampler. And then you'd hear all these, what we thought were keyboard sounds. And we later found out were like synthesizer sounds. Because we bought like a cheap, crappy keyboard when we had a summer job a couple of years later. And the sounds were a cheap, crappy keyboard like that someone might play some ballads on in a pub or something. And uh, so, like, so we realized, okay, we need to find a synthesizer. And then uh, our local music store had like this old rack synthesizer, not with keys, but just- Euro rack box. synthesizer. Oh no, 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 no. This was years before Euro rack. So just the standard rack that would go into like a studio. Standard, standard 19 rack. inch. Yeah, yeah, one unit. And it was a Casio uh, synth. But it had cool sounds, but to edit it was a nightmare. Fortunately, it came with a, a, a what do you call it, a manual, and I'm the type of person who reads. So I figured it out somewhat. And then we finished school, we started working, and we started putting all the money we earned into buying instruments. So, and that included a, a sampler from Roland, it included a, a Gork Prophecy synthesizer, and uh, yeah, and it just went from there. But um, funny enough, as children, our father used to play electronic versions of Beethoven's uh, Moonlight Sonata to put us to sleep. And it's a like famous record from a Japanese composer. And uh, yeah, so we were actually kind of, as even as babies, we're hearing electronic music. Um, or as young children. Okay. Longest story. <laughs> yeah, Longest sorry. <laughs> well, I enjoy it. Thank you. Uh, so question number two, what made you want to become a musician? Ooh. Well, like I said, hearing that Slayer record, that really, Slayer, that, I, 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 yeah, I literally woke Gosh, up. Michael That's what I've, yeah, what I've told people is that record literally woke me up as a child and up until I was that 12. I was walking around, I was doing stuff. I was, I was, I was told, hey, go to school. I was going to school. So and I heard that record. Can you play some riffs of Slayer, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I still got my, <laughs> still got my bass, right? Oh, my God. Good. Excellent. You're a metalhead and a producer of electronic music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, but, and so here we are. Like, that's what, Slayer South of Heaven, and here we are. Uh, I like Slayer, I like thrash metal, I'm big fans of Brutal Death Metal. Do you know the band Brutal Truth? 
Brutal death metal. I was going to say because Brutal Truth are more grindcore. But when that when they, they have a particular record, I think it was their first uh, extreme it's conditions like, demand like extreme band, responses. What a band I, I listened at that time. Because I, I leave metal in 2018 and 2019 starting electronic music. <laughs> so it's been but maybe the, 10 years I still listen metal uh, with a various genre, power metal, heavy metal, brutal death metal, black metal. I'm big fans of black metal. The satanic black metal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, but interestingly, a lot of people here I've met and who I'm friends with in the experimental electronic scene, especially here in Berlin, uh, and a lot of the people are often... The city of techno. Met. Berlin is a city of techno. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, better, for better and worse, Mike. Yes. Are the capital one of the capitals like Detroit and so on? Hello, but interesting DJ here. Is there. Yeah, but what I but I think most DJs aren't really artists. Um, but I'm saying that I, I think many people who can play a music instrument aren't really a musician if they're just playing other people's songs and so on, as opposed to creating. But that's that's been kind of quite judgmental and a bit tough. Um, because for years, <clears throat> it took me, well, I wouldn't say years. Then again, I learned playing songs from other bands, but I quickly started making my own riffs and then writing songs or trying to. So, hmm. but here in Berlin, a lot of people in the experimental scene, they often have a background in metal and punk and hardcore and then black metal as well. So I've, I've seen that firsthand here, actually. So somehow these influences and these styles creep into a experimental music, arguably, are the noisier sides of it, the more industrial sides, and so on. Interesting. Good. Hmm. Well, okay, let's jump to the next question. And what kind of music theory you have? Did you say uh, music theory? No, not theory, but gear. Music gear. Oh, gear, Jesus. I was hearing the word beer, and then I heard music I have beer. I'm like, ah. <laughs> this will kill me. <laughs> no, 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 no problems. Um, so apart from having uh, my good old guitar from the from the old days, my PV guitar. So uh, do you use Fender or Jackson? What kind of brand? No, I came across a guitar from PV that wasn't a cheap, made in Indonesia or made in China or whatever in Vietnam. A Kobe kind of guitar, a Kobe, a Kobe I get your guitar. This is yeah. good. It's good. The Kobe instrument is good. Oh yeah, no, no, no. There's many. There is many good stuff, right? Um, yeah, the guitar I have. It's not a well-known guitar, but it's one piece. It's a solid guitar. It's got humbuckers and stuff. But then I don't use it much. So the main gear I'm using, actually, is <laughs> a lot of gears. Better to. Better to show you something interesting. When I play live. I don't like to take a big Eurorack system unless it's a gig where it's modular. But this that's noise cool, box. Cool. Oh, yeah, noise box. Right. Cool. So it's, it's four oscillators. Yes. Right? You got switches to determine how they interact with each other. And then you've got like three volume pots and an on off switch and a battery. And the three volume pots are great because one is for the first oscillator, one's for the last, and one is for mixing them like ring modulation. Understand. And this box with some good effects yes. is, uh, is absolutely fantastic. People, after the performances, have often you're, come up to me and be like... Fans of modular uh, synthesizer. I, um, I'm, I'm not so sure I would say I'm a big fan. Um, but I somewhat... I work in the industry a little bit. Um, I make... I make much better visuals using a video synthesizer in the Eurorack format than I think I make music. But then again, on my YouTube is a lot of music or noise I've made with a Eurorack synth. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, well, that's, yeah. So favorite gear. Do you know the company WMD from America? I hear it. Yeah. They make Eurorack stuff, but they also make non-Eurorack stuff. And they have a particular guitar pedal called the Geiger Counter. And uh, this is 
in my life. No. Me, me. Ah. For me, I'm using a software synthesizer, just like Suron, Diva, and uh, yeah. Expands, uh, Onimusphere. Do, do you use VCV rack? Yes, I use it not much, but uh, for a test, the first time I yeah. tested for understanding the modular synthesizer. That's what it's perfect for. Yeah, as an education. This is my first start. This is my first start. The yeah. modular. Yeah. That's it's cool. Nice, it's nice software to understand the basics. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But you can also get, get much more complicated with it. So it, um, it's time, a good piece of software. When you go deep with the modular, there's a lot of complex things inside the modular synthesizer, advanced synthesis, a lot of things. But often, I find that the best sounds I make are, is keeping it simple, not going over the top with, with the complication. Then it gets, um, it's like getting lost in a maze. So sometimes you just keep it simple and you, you go left, you go right, and then you double back and you kind of try to figure out, ah. So it's often steps forward, steps back, plugging in, plugging out. And, and, but it is about experimenting and discovering. And I think that's the... That's the, the, the most positive aspect of a Eurorack synth. But it is also uh, the disastrous part is um, knowing when to stop with how big a system can get and the budget required, the money required to get one. It's not cheap. Um, yes. so oh, it's, it's not cheap. Right. There's pros and cons. And of course, in Iraq for yourself in Baghdad, like... Is there actually a single store selling synthesizers, hardware synthesizers, uh, or even? Uh, to be honest, uh, no store in Iraq playing uh, synthesizer or uh, even the music gears. No. Mm. But I purchased it from Amazon. I buy it from Amazon. Ah, and then it's imported. Well, just my Amazon is my soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here in Iraq, no store, uh, no one play uh, even yeah. selling. Uh, Instruments, gears. Yeah, sadly. So sad. The weather yeah. is 55. <laughs> it's hell. <laughs> well, no yeah, one that's... cares here in Iraq about the electronic music. No one cares about uh, any kind of field. I don't know why. I don't know. I well, life is, yeah. life is a lot tougher there than here in Europe or in North America. So um, I think everyday life for most people in Iraq is the focus is people focus on the more important things, water, food, the yes, roof, yes, electricity. It's the important circle. Mm -hmm. We're living, married, kids, life, water, food. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. No well, it's, music, well, no. Yeah. Well, it's music is a, yeah, music is a luxury. Like it's, it, creativity is fantastic and a good thing, but it is a luxury. Um, I would argue, um, outside of the most important things. And, uh, and interestingly here in Berlin, there's a lot of uh, single people, a lot of people who leave their countries or leave their families and so on to have that pressure taken away from them. They would rather follow their art, their creativity, or what makes them happy, and it might be music. They don't have to be creating music to enjoy music. And uh, they come to Berlin to kind of join the, the permanent party or the never ending party. <laughs> well, here in New York, uh, just a few people playing electronic music, me and mm -hmm. another one. Maybe two people in Baghdad playing electronic music. Or two people, yeah. Or Baghdad. two people you know of that the, the could, I'm sure there's more, but finding them is the trouble. Well, in the right, the scene, no one know about the electronic music, even mm. my people. No one know this field. They mm. just listen to Iraqi music, and I don't like Iraqi music. <laughs> I, was, I was the same with Irish music growing up, so, and growing up in Ireland, so I know what you mean. I wish that electronic music in, in Iraq or in Baghdad would grow day by day or in the future. It's mm. very important to people to know this field. It's magnificent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I would suggest um, trying to start a uh, trying to start a Facebook group um, or a Discord group, a Discord server, and try to connect people, try to find people. And you're doing that internationally. That's quite clear. And you're doing a good job of it because I saw the amount of interviews and the different, the various people and so on. It's very so important on. to communicate with each other, knowing each other. And uh, it's so important to mm. communicate with the artists, uh, write about them, study their type of music and a lot of things. Agreed. Share art, share albums, make some support. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Music important. is, yeah, definitely. Music, yeah. music is, is communication. Language. It's exactly. Languages. Okay, yeah. another, another question. So what's your, uh, who's your favorite artist you look up in the industry? Ooh. Uh, take a deep breath, my friend. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know what? I'm someone who, I'm easily distracted but I, I also like discovering. So I'm often listening every couple of years. I'll often go deeper into a different music genre or... You're a various artist and a various genre, right? You, just, yeah. you are not just playing noise or experience. There's a lot of bands, oh, sorry, a lot of uh, genres you play. You be techno. Yeah, st and, yeah, styles of music um, and instruments, different instruments and so on. Like... Um, at a certain point, Bach was very interesting to me, the German composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, J.S. Bach, and uh, in terms of his, the style of his compositions and so on. Um, Classical oh, composition. Yeah, but, but there are more interesting composers. And you know what? You know who's a classical composer who I've always loved is you have Shostakovich, a famous Russian composer whose symphonies are fantastic and very much are very uh, influential on what's on, on soundtrack music, especially more intense, more darker, in interesting soundtrack music. And I'm also trying to think of Stravinsky, another Russian composer um, mm -hmm. who wrote a very famous piece called The Rite of Spring, which is actually a ballet. So often people hear the music and say, oh, this is boring. But then when you see it performed, when you see the ballet performed and hear the music in sync with it, then the music suddenly becomes much more interesting. And he also wrote a fantastic piece of music called Firebird, which I guess is like another word for Phoenix and um, the classic bird rising from the ashes and, and a rebuilding. And this piece, Firebird, is absolutely fantastic. And Stravinsky is very interesting because he might have been the first composer who, and he was a conductor of his music. He was the first conductor from outside South Africa to play in apartheid Africa and to play exclusively or to also play for African people, for the native people of South Africa. He was invited to play there and he said, there's no way I'm only pay playing for white people. That's bullshit. If, you're, if I'm going to go there and play for white people, I'm also playing for African people. And, um, and that was a long time ago. That might have been even in the, the 80s um, before apartheid ended. So uh, Stravinsky is a very, not just a fantastic composer, but actually his attitudes within uh, society and so on were, uh, he pushed, he pushed boundaries, he pushed barriers. So... Uh, because he recognized, yeah, yeah, because he, his music is very rhythmic. I like the pitches he used, the scales. It's very dark and, and menacing and interesting, not just major and minor keys and so on, not just nice melodies that you can whistle to, but rhythmically, he, he recognized the, uh, the very advanced rhythms that you hear in various styles of music from all across the African continent. And realize that, okay, maybe in Europe we mastered our uh, melody or we really went very complex into melody, into chords, into like symphonies, carceros and all this stuff. But whereas the rhythms were very simple, very lacking, the structures weren't interesting. It took a long time for that to change. 
but but he saw within various music across the African continent from 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 a few of the cultures he was able to study that yeah the rhythm rhythm was what was uh taken to a, a whole new level and that it took a I long understand. time. I, yeah, I like rhythm music is very important. Oh yeah. Oh it's a fundament. It's the base, the foundation. Yeah. Another question for the time, Please. because just we have 40 minutes in Zoom uh, for True. basic accounts. Ah, I forgot that. Yeah. Because Go Zoom for it. give us a 40 minute because we have a basic account, not pro account. Yeah. Ah, I got to remember that. Okay. Cool. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, what is your great view process? What is my great greatest creative did you say? process? What is your oh. creative process in music? Oh wow, wow, wow! <laughs> Honestly, um, I do hear music in my head from time to time. I'll hear a rhythm. I'll hear lyrics, and it's and when that happens, I'm I'm always walking, and so it's important for me to go outside at least every day and just walk. Just a little, not, I don't have to walk miles or kilometers or for hours. No, 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 just a few minutes. And interestingly, I think it's the rhythm of the walking. Inspiration, when you want to make music, you walk a miles, right? Well, it's a funny one. I think even just the simple walking, the simple movement, creating a basic rhythm, and then somehow uh, just something happens. It just, it's a start, it's like a seed. So it starts the process, but also, um, just picking up the instruments or just switching on the gear, the, the synthesizers, the, 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 the pedals, the, the, the Eurorack modular, putting on my headphones or switching on the speakers. I, I think often as well, it's just switch it on and just do something. It doesn't have to be magic from the very first seconds. Often it takes time to explore and so on. So sometimes with some of my recordings that you heard on SoundCloud, sometimes I might be playing for two hours, three hours. And then it's I'm like, right. now this is... I listen yeah. a lot of instruments in our music. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, I like to play different instruments, but then the key thing is, is that I'll play for a while and after a certain amount of time, it could be 10 minutes, it could be two hours. Then I'm like, oh, now I like this. Then I press the record button and I keep playing. And then after, I don't know, 10 minutes or, or an hour, then I press stop. Once I'm like, okay, now I'm finished, I press stop. And then I'll either just do something else and then later go back to the recording once I'm home or something, if I'm not at my rehearsal room, for instance. Then I go home with the recording and then put that in my computer. So I don't use computers for making music for creativity, but I use it for editing and so on. And, recording uh, and editing. And the computer is fantastic to light, too. Light, right? Did you sorry say that again? Do you using Ableton Live digital audio workstation? Data we? No, 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 no. Um, I often record just to two tracks, and so I will just put those two tracks into uh, uh, SoundForge or into Audacity, and then cut and cut off the the beginning, the end, compress I it, I master yes. it, that kind of thing. Simple, Audacity. simple kind of mastering. And then so, upload it. <laughs> you did a great job. Cheers. Okay, another question. So, are there any artists that you draw inspiration from? If so, who and what sort of music? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of questions. <laughs> and, the, the challenge is how to condense that answer, is to condense my answer. Um, because although I make often noisy music, um, or if I help out at events, it's at noisier events or sometimes techno events, these are styles of music I don't tend to listen to a lot at home. I would listen, like, I'm happy listening to Florence and the Machine. Their second record for me is an absolutely fantastic record. Um, um, ceremonies it's called um, Anna Calvi another lady who plays guitar and kind of makes noisy pop music uh, is an, another favorite 
But again, I actually stopped listening to them. But they both played here in concert last weekend at a big festival. So I was very happy to hear them. Um, as I was growing up as a teenager and for a long, long time ministry with Al Jurgensen and Paul Barker, these, their music has, has always been a very good influence on me. And uh, Paul Barker has a solo album called Fix This. Um, that's fantastic. And now he's playing with the Tool singer in another band, um, maybe Pussifier, I think. So Paul Barker actually is a, is a really cool key influence because he's a bass player and a producer, synthesizer player and stuff. So, uh, yeah, he'd be a key person. Yeah, I guess we should leave it at that. Well, uh, last question. Do you see that much remaining vegan time? Yeah. Okay. So, last question. And uh, what's the process you go through in finding the perfect town? Do you study with courses, learning online, or just experiment? Just say the question again one more time because I, I think you said tone, and I'm not sure. Okay. I will yeah, play my question. Please. Okay, so what process you go through in finding the perfect term? Do you study with courses, learning online, or just experiment? Ah, that's a really good question, actually. I um, <laughs> when I finished school, like high, the, the American equivalent of high school, um, I was 17. But the year before, the summer before, my brother and I were playing with a good friend, a good old friend, and he played guitar. I was singing, playing bass. We did a demo. We did our first demo tape in a studio. It was like we just booked six hours. We wanted to record two songs. And so we recorded them. We just played the music first. Then I sang, recorded the vocals. And then we had an hour to mix it. And the engineer, I told him, hey, the vocals are too loud. I don't want to. I don't want it to sound like a typical demo where the vocal is way too loud, and we and you don't hear the music, and nobody would play it in the radio and stuff, like on a metal show or something. And he said, "Oh, I'm turning it down," and he was pulling a fader now, and I realized he was pulling the wrong fader, and I said, "Hey, that's not the fader for the voice. This is the fader," and he looked at me with surprise. He was like, "Really? Uh, you're not supposed to know that," and. So he turned it down a tiny bit. I said, turn it down more. Like, we're paying you. We're paying for this demo. And anyhow, immediately we left. We, we played the tape in, the, in my friend's father's car. because he, he, he came and picked us up. And the vocals are too loud. And it's like, oh, man, like, damn. And instantly my brother said, um, Robin, you've got to become a sound engineer. And I was like, whoa, you're right. And uh, so then I finished school a year later at 17. And um, I then was working and I saved up enough money to pay for a private course in sound engineering. And uh, I'd begun that course two years later. And so that was in the late 90s. And that course was one year and like 40 hours a week. And we had access to a crap studio. But it was a studio and... In that two years, my brother and I were also buying equipment. So I went into that course knowing a lot, but I got an awful lot more out of it. Learning how to really use a compressor, learning how to really use EQ really good, um, learning what to, what, what, how to present the material to a mastering engineer, and then they put the final polish on it, stuff like this, editing and so on. What the tracks you studying? Just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... But also, with time, what I learned was that um, at that time and, and later, that sometimes you, you, can be, you, can, you can study something, you can read about a certain technique, or you can watch a video and see somebody telling you something or suggesting something, demonstrating a certain technique. And then you can try that. But sometimes your ears aren't ready. Sometimes you're... Your ears haven't caught up with your brain or your eyes. They, ha they, they haven't caught up with what you're seeing. Your ears also somehow need to gain experience or your brain does in terms of hearing. And so that What's developing tone, yeah, developing a sense of tone, 
what sounds good, what sounds bad is the simplistic star. But then, ah, the bass is too muddy. Uh, the treble is too sharp. It's not a nice, shiny, smooth treble and high end. It's, it's a sharp, nasty and figuring out if someone says to me, hey, it's too smooth. It's like, OK, let's make it harder, harsher. If the bass is too muddy, oh, let's clean it up and clear it up. And so as a sound engineer and as a musician, I then learn to clean my sound, but still keep it noisy and, and hard and tough and interesting and so on. But I learn to make it clean and to make it sound as good as possible. And people often, when they've seen me perform and so on, they would, they would say to me, whoa, how come your sound was like so clean and clear, but cool? And, and yet the other artist wasn't. And when I perform live, a part of my setup is a simple sound, enge sound engineering tools um, and in particular graphic EQs. And that way I can really control the, uh, the frequency range of the overall sound. So I can pull out certain frequencies. I can introduce certain frequencies. And then, so I'm, for me, with music and with noise and so on with my little system, it's I'm sculpting the sound. That's how I see it. And that's how I feel it. And the instruments are my tools of, for what I'm sculpting. And so sometimes it's a big hammer to really dramatically change the sound. And sometimes it's a very fine file to just smooth something very delicately and to create a shape. And, um, and sometimes what the shape is, I don't know until it's finished. Because you just, for me, with sculpture, you start with a big block. And then you start to chip away with a hammer and stuff and a file. And, uh, and then, some, and then you, see, you either start to see it as it forms or you, in your head you already have pre-planned or you, you have a picture. So for me, with noise, it's sculpture. You're right with everything. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Oh, but there's many different ways to answer these questions. And as long as the answers are honest from the person or from the people, that's what's important. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to see you with another live music interview in the future. So we can continue our journey together with the new questions, new journey. Uh, Please. Of course. It's I've honor to me today to meet you in person. I'll chat with you. And I'm very happy, very excited. I'm looking forward to the, in the future making the music together, you and I, maybe collaborate audio or something and enjoy. That'll be cool. Sharing the music and chatting together and see you around. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. No, no, no. Thank you for uh, reaching out and um, and for answering my question because I, I then contacted you and then you instantly got back to me. So I'm, I'm very happy. I love to be surprised. It, that Actually, Thank even just so saying much. that gives me so goosebumps. That's so uh, no, to me, to me, Jim Bersner, you are a great composer, great artist. And you did a great job with the music, with the art, and your uh, genre is perfect. I like it. I like your music, your tone in your music, a lot of things. Hmm. So, okay, see Thank you around. You. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. See you around, my friend. We'll do. Talk soon. Take care. Take care of yourself. Bye. We'll do. Bye bye.